Five Eyes TV. Today we are profiling Miss Inga Lauriston, who for many years have worked in the caring industry and recently started your theatre company called Real Speak. Can you tell us a little bit about the Real Speak Theatre Company? The caring profession these days has many constraints on you, as you probably know. The red tape, the do's and don'ts. And in society generally I feel that we are not allowed to use our intuition and our general um, intelligence. And so I was always frustrated, so I decided to use my um, years of experience of working with many different sectors of society and my love of working with people, putting that together with my love of the arts, drama, dance, music. That's interesting because I, was, I wanted to see the correlation between the caring profession and how that translates into the arts that okay. you do. The work I do, um, for example, when I work with disabilities, I've spent many years working with disabilities as a carer, as a manager. My knowledge of working with people with disabilities therefore enables me to have empathy and an understanding of their needs, I hope. So when I use my, my counselling skills and my knowledge, I also use drama as a, as a forum because that enables these groups who often aren't allowed a voice to feel safe and secure in the environment I create for them to be able to express okay. themselves. What kind of groups or disadvantaged members of society are we actually speaking about here? Well, I will speak theatre, right? It's is, is, is not just a dance or theatre company. It's a company which uses therapeutic and holistic approaches. So we create unique um, projects, um, performance that promote integration and imagination. We encourage each individual to um, develop their own potential, which in itself promotes self-confidence, self-worth, and the all-important voice. So when we finish a project, it's not just that we're saying goodbye. We know that we've then helped, hopefully, as many individuals as we can to go then on into the real world again and be able to feel confident about being able to um, discuss issues that they maybe have found difficult in the past. Right. What, what special groups of society do you actually target with the Real Speak Theatre okay. theater Company? Well, I've, I've, I've been doing some work with MenCap. I work with um, young people who um, suffer from mental health. Young, young people who are on ASBOs, who are possibly alcoholics, addicts. I work with children, three to four year olds. I've worked with the elderly. It, it goes across the board. Any, anyone that's really interested, and, and at the moment I'm hoping to get some work with Bangladeshi women in Salisbury, which is where I'm based at the moment. Hmm. I, I actually see the correlation now. I, what I'd like to know is what actually gave you the idea in the first place, because you gave up a well-paying job to mm. actually take that first step with no guarantees. So what actually gave you the idea or gave you the push? Ever since I started working when I was 16, I've always somehow managed to, to get theatre and drama into my work. Whether it was at Christmas time and I was working, say, with the homeless, I would say, come on, we're going to do something. And I'd work with them and it always worked. You know, rather than sitting there doing woodwork on Mondays, swimming on Tuesdays, what they may want to do, here you are. I'm letting you say what you want. You can say what you like to me. As long as you're not an arsonist, then I'd have to go and tell someone, or you've murdered someone. So you're providing that forum for people to use their voices where they've probably never been allowed to. Right. You, you sometimes have been seen as a bit of a maverick. Now, tell me, has it been easy actually fighting red tape and authority? Um. But there will always be that problem because when people ask me to do the work who, do not, who are not artistic and who, who cannot foretell or foresee how things may happen, yes, I have come across people who have said, we don't like the way you're um, 
we don't like we don't like the way that you're um, coming across. For example, when I work with young people recently, I had a group of 25, 13 to 19 year olds who sat and said nothing. So the hour's worth of sitting down with my colleagues saying this is what we're going to do was suddenly thrown out the window and I had to think on my feet and I thought, right, I'm going to have to use language they would understand on the streets. So I swore. And that was seen as being not a good thing to do. But as soon as I mentioned the word police, I got a reaction and that wasn't um, likened too much either. But the point is, I do get a reaction and I use that then. Right. Now tell me, have you actually had any help from bigger companies such as Mencap, Scope, any of, the, any of those companies bearing in mind that <coughs> what you do aimed at people that they're supposed to actually care for? Have they been forthcoming with any help whatsoever? Oh yes, um, definitely. I, I did a performance in January at the Salisbury Playhouse which was a controversial piece called Fill My Boots with people with disabilities. And some of the, um, the topics were very controversial. They, they, we talked about um, relationships, sex, um, how they felt about being called disabled, whether in fact they thought they were disabled and they didn't, but they thought I was, which was certainly fair enough. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> Expand on that. Expand on that um, more for us, please. I asked one more lady who has cerebral palsy, I said to her, what is the difference between you and me? Mm -hmm. And she said, you can talk, I can't. And simple as that, people with disabilities are totally mis misunderstood generally by the, the, the public, which is fair enough. But they're very open and very honest and very um, perceptive much more so than many groups that I've worked with. They know how you feel. That you, I walk in a room, Inga, what's the matter today? They know. Mm. Now, I remember not long ago, I had the, the pleasure of seeing you at one of your performances. Would, could you give us a flavor of that, just for the audience who might not have seen it? Well, I suppose so. I mean. I, Sometimes I do, I do a lot of writing, which I use in my work, and I either perform it myself or I get people to perform it with me. And this could have been seen as quite controversial, and I was a little bit worried about the response I might get from the audience afterwards. I wrote a piece, and with their permission, the group's permission... What, what kind of... Uh... That these people were 16 to up to 75 years of age with disabilities, and learning difficulties, uh -huh. and we, we wrote, we did this performance, which a lot of it was ad-libbing, and I asked the permission, I read out what I was going to do, yeah. and I said, look, I am going to read this as if I'm in a wheelchair and I have cerebral palsy like you, and I read it and I said, does that sound all right to you? And this young lady said, that's fine, Inga. This is the young lady with... with cerebral palsy. She so said, I know I sound like that. Yeah, so you got the okay from... Yes. You, cannot, you cannot do any work like this unless they have your respect. And because I and those who I employ with me have knowledge and are sensitive to the needs of different groups we work with, because each group's different, you cannot possibly be allowed to do this. And they've gone away, the final performance of this, they went away, they told me to go off stage. One bloke, he just said, Inga, we've had enough of you, and off you went. They took over the whole performance. How fantastic is that? That's wonderful. I didn't need to be there. <laughs> That's absolutely <laughs> wonderful. Okay, would you like, would you like to Yes, but um, I need um, my partner to come in here and read it with me, please. Right, this, um, this piece of prose that myself and Paddy are going to perform, is the piece that I actually wrote um, in mind with this lady who had cerebral palsy. Um, and I asked her permission if I could speak like her. Um, basically, I'm being wheeled into a room in my house and my carer is taking no notice of me. And these are the thoughts that she feels for her carer. And when she's finished, he then responds, responds to her. 
how he feels about the woman he's caring for. And this piece is called Seeing is Believing. You have no idea what you look like today. No idea at all. You come into my space with your face all screwed up as if it's my fault. I'm quite capable, you know. Quite sane, in fact. I would consider myself to be balanced. Are you? Yes, I'm talking about you. Just because you got your back turned does not mean I cannot understand. Look at your shoulders, all hunched over. You're all lopsided. As for your hair, you're beginning to look like Tony Blair, receding quickly. Did you brush it this morning? If you did, it was without care. God's man, you got no flair. I know you only work with me, get paid salary to keep body and soul together. Wife is a pain in the ass. The kids drive you to drink. But please think, am I not entitled to some sort of dignity? What happened to equality? Equal ops, no discrimination. But these are all words now in this nation, in my house, that you invade with your grumpy, screwed up face. Finding out what makes you tick. Uh, it's like flailing around the boat when you're sick. You're in me head. And I don't want you there. You're getting everywhere. Even in me here. It's not easy, you know, looking after you. You don't say enough to make yourself heard. Might as well sit on your perch. Like a fragile bird. Why aren't you frustrated with me? When I give you the same old tea. Scramble egg on toast. Come on, man, let's have a toast. Toast to the ones who are articulate. Toast to the ones who don't give up. Just give me a sign. Then I know someone's there. If it doesn't happen soon, I'll fill up like a balloon. Full, full of air, that's me. What are you smiling at me? woman who I can't bear to look after <laughs> understands everything I'm yeah. thinking uh -huh. so there's more there yeah. although she never communicates with me she mm -hmm. understands and it's like what are you doing la smiling at me it's like Whew. do you get me mm -hmm. do you get me sorry no, no. But it has to be right yeah, no, no. otherwise it looks false so you've actually got to turn a smile in. I did. That's what I did. But and he's, he's got to notice you smiling. Yeah. Oh. So it just could do the last few sentences if that's all right. Just give me a sign that I know someone's there. If it doesn't happen soon, I'll fill up like a balloon. Full of air, that's me. <laughs> Why are you smiling at me? Okay. Never tell what someone feels or someone who's, you know, look at me, you, you perceive something, I perceive something, I perceive something. But never ever, you know, there's much more to that. Okay. How has your transition from Brixton to the wilds of Wiltshire, was it an easy, easy transformation? No. <laughs> I have found it very difficult. You know, I suppose you're going to start, you want to know a little bit about me, aren't you? Yes, I do. All right, well, I have um, two mixed parentage children. Their father is a black Jamaican. Um, unfortunately, we were separated. Whilst I was in London, I was very much, most of my friends, I'd say, were, were black. 
and therefore I have, you know, a deep love and understanding of that culture. And going to Salisbury was absolutely dreadful to begin with. Um, as a white woman with blonde hair, grey eyes, speaking like I do, I can talk like something else as well if you like. <laughs> I was no. stereotyped. And then when they saw these two little black children, it was, well, oh, she sleeps with black men. One of those. And it was, it, I was very isolated, and I still feel that today. Um, which is why I try and work um, with, with minority groups in Wiltshire. But right. the main majority groups in Wiltshire, of course, are um, the gypsies, um, the chavs that are hated, and the Bangladeshis, Europe, and mainly um, Eastern European. The black people are very far and few between, so they're not really, you know, talked mm. about as much. But have, have, you, have you found that um, <coughs> bringing up to mixed race children in Wiltshire, they are well adjusted because I, I mean, I know for a fact that um, your youngest son has just achieved a, an MA, so that, that... He's actually my eldest, but that's just, yeah. That, well, that, that is a tribute to, to what you've actually done. They, because I think um, they have a lot of confidence anyway and they understand their black culture and their white culture, they actually educated their peers at school. Oh. And I'm so proud of that. So no, they've done very well, but I still find it difficult because I'm stereotyped, as we all are, aren't we? E you know, yes. we're, everyone's stereotypes. This has been Vince for Five Eyes TV. We'll be back after this break. First school year. She smokes little white rocks to forget. She drinks when she remembers. Never looks in the mirror without her dark glasses on. Just can't make sense of what she sees. Trip after trip, cloud nine coming round again. So much anger running through her veins. She can't remember the pain. She's forgotten the pleasure. It doesn't really matter. It's all one. It's all one and the same. Nighttime is her time. In and out of the slamming car doors. Another faceless stranger. Another needed dollar. Tough guys with small hearts. Keeps her living in the twilight zone. It's the nature of the business. They're all part of the game. Trip after trip. Cloud nine coming round again with anger running through her veins. How to get off this merry-go-round? Can't remember when her feet left the ground. She's not here, she's gone away. She's gone to stay. You see, she died the other day. Never reached her first score year. Too much anger running through her veins. All my harsh words of love, all my soft words of anger, fell on deaf ears. She just couldn't hear. Tough guys with small hearts took her life away. You see, my sister died the other day. Because Cloud9 came home and refused to go away. Cloud9 came home and took my sister to stay. She's not here. Cloud9 took my sister away. This is Kieran Allen on FiveEyes.tv. Can you tell us a little about Inga when she isn't working, when she isn't in the theatre? What does Inga do to relax? I'm not in the theatre, I run workshops. OK. Um, what do I do when I relax? I don't relax, really. I live in a tumble-down cottage. Um, I'm in the middle of a farm, so from Brixton to that, and being a single parent, um, I'm just always doing something. The only time I relax is when I get a bottle of red wine, I got the old coal fire going, and I sit in front of that and watch EastEnders. How <laughs> sad is that? How sad is that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, well, okay, what about music? What kind of music do you, do you enjoy listening to? Eclectic taste there. From Bob Marley to Beethoven. Yes, I've seen your impression of Bob Marley. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is life like on the farm? Because I have I have visited you on the on your on your farm before, and especially in the summer months, it's idyllic. Surely that gives you some of your inspiration for what you do. Yes, it does. It gives you peace of mind. Um, but there's always, there's always, we're always hankering after something else, aren't we? When I lived in London, I hankered for the tranquility. When I'm there, I miss the people. I miss that, that mix of people, which I don't get. 
Yeah, but th this hankering, I mean, is it reflected in a lot in some of the work that you do? No. No, because each, each, each piece of work that I do, because I run workshops basically, or do corporate training, each piece is different. And the people I work with, I love the people I work with, they inspire me. In fact, I learn more from the people I work with than they'll ever learn from me. I'm sure of that. That's wonderful. Inga, we know that some groups are hard to reach, like for example, youngsters. Mm. How do you go about actually making contact and getting through to that particular group? Well, I have, I have had a, a couple of weeks ago a, a very difficult <laughs> session with over 25 young people aged between 16 to 19 who are part of a Drama Express project, which is actually a nationwide express, uh, project. Um, they didn't want to engage at all. They didn't even want to speak. So the hours long um, getting together and working out what we were going to do for the first session went out the window. So I had to resort to quite extreme measures. And I um, found a poem which I felt was relevant to them. So I decided to stand up and read this poem. And I then asked them what they felt about it, who they thought may have written it, and why. Would you, and so I, if I read it to you, you might get some idea. Sorry, I've got to put my lovely NHS glasses on. <laughs> it's be called Because I Like It. Saw your ugly mutt walk towards me, you clock me bitch, and cut across to the other side. Come now, let's bring it on, sister, mister, feel my fister. That was in my head. Felt my body oozing adrenaline. Rhymes with bin, rubbish, shit. You get me? But I don't have to talk like that. We don't all come up from the gutter. Oh, please, see our splatter shoes hot too, striding faster. Mouth of them paving slabs that your dad put down for the council. Sad old git. Now I feel like a tigress, beautiful, sleek and strong. All those tiny hairs on the back of my arms standing up. Tiger blood pumping through my veins. Watch it, bitch. I'm ready to pounce. I can smell her sweat crossing over to the other side. Sweet fear like it's her aura. Keep it coming, sweetness. Now slow motion, like one of those silent movies the old dear watches, black and white. Slamming in, punching her fat, wobbly belly. She's bending over, face all squirming, fans like on her like an old used up hag. Right her on the face. Back to real motion. Get home. Put on the telly, Mum says. You want fish and chips for your tea? No, Tar. I've had my fill. <laughs> <coughs> I asked the young people. They were a bit bemused that I, because they'd only ever met, they'd met me for half an hour at that sport point, that I was able to speak like that, I suppose. And they decided it was probably a young, very angry, 16, 17 year old. And so they talked for a bit. I said, would you like to know who wrote that? He said, I said, it was me. And I'm 51. And I said, well, how can you write something like that then? I said, well, there you go. There's more to meet the eye. And that's why I believe in all of you, young people, because you're not just hoodies. You're not just granny bashers. You're not just drug takers. There's more than meets the eye. And that's how I see things in reality. And with compassion, I hope. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. I'd just like to say thank you to Vince for interviewing me. And what I would really like is for anyone out there who's interested in anything I've said, has got their own thoughts and feelings, and would be interested in joining me. And quite honestly, I'm quite prepared to travel anywhere or have anyone come and visit me. Thank you. This has been Five Eyes TV, and from Inga Loriston from Real Speak Theatre Company, I'd like to give you my email address, which is 
real-speak at hotmail.co.uk. Thank you.